Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, I want to let you guys know that I'm going to aim to be releasing, uh, instead of two podcast interviews a week, I'm going to try and do three or four, just because I think that now uh, that we're all involved in this this giant mess together and we're going through uncertain times, I think that one of the things that we can control in the world that's outside of our control uh, is to come back to philosophy and to come back to learning and educating ourselves and listening to these great teachers from all around the world who are really thinking about the important questions of life. And so I'm really excited to be uh, churning out these interviews for you guys, uh, getting you some great content. And, and I tell you what, I'm absolutely loving the process along the way, getting to meet all of these incredible people like the guest that I have on today for you, Dr. Kevin Vost. Now, before I jump into the interview, I want to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Kevin Vost and his work. So, uh, he is the author of more than a dozen books uh, with more in press, bringing his knowledge of classical Greco-Roman and medieval scholastic philosophy, modern cognitive psychology, and high-intensity strength training to bear on issues of Catholic catechetics, uh, apologetics, saints' biographies, spiritual growth, and physical fitness. And he's also written about the links between Stoicism and Christianity in his book, The Porch and the Cross. Now, in terms of his education, highly impressive, uh, and it's going to be a miracle if I get through this uh, without messing up. But uh, Dr. Vost, he holds a Doctor of Psychology in Clinical Psychology degree from the Adler School of Professional Psychology in Chicago with internship and dissertation work at the SIU School of Medicine's Alzheimer Center's Memory and Aging Clinic. Uh, He has also taught psychology and gerontology, uh, which is the study of old age, at Aquinas University, the University of Illinois, uh, McMurray University, sorry, McMurray College, and Lincoln Land Community College. Uh, Kevin has also served as a research review committee member for the American Mensa, a society promoting the scientific study of human intelligence, and as an advisory board member for the International Association of Resistance Trainers, which is a group that certifies personal fitness trainers. So, oh my gosh, such a cool guy and, and honestly had such a great conversation with him. I want to get him on again and again so we can keep on getting great information out of him, but... Uh, Without any further ado, no, actually, before that, I am going to put all of the links to where you can find his works, find his books, and find his websites online in the show notes, so make sure you go there. And as always, make sure you reach out to him and let him know how much you appreciated him coming on the show. But now, without any further ado, I present to you Dr. Kevin Vost. Yeah, look, Kevin, I'm so excited to have you here, and, and you know, you came at high recommendation from some of my listeners as well. And, uh, you know, they've been wanting to hear from you. And I, I have been very interested in, in the past and I still am continuing to be interested in the connections between Stoicism and Christianity and, and, and uh, you know, even just the, the significance of that, that relationship historically. Um, and, you know, you've even, you've even written a book, uh, the, the Porch and the Cross, I believe I'm getting that right. Um, yes. But, uh, you know, I'd love to just let you start. What, what do you think are the main connections between, between Stoicism and, and Christianity historically? Yeah, and I will, you know, preface that, like, some people who look at the intersections between Christianity and Stoicism will focus on things like the way that Stoic thought influenced people like St. Paul, who mm. wrote his letters, you know, who was pretty much a contemporary, for example, of, of Seneca. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I'm no scriptural scholar. That's not you know my particular area where I where I delve into. Mm. When I look at the intersection of Stoicism and Christianity, I'm mainly looking at it through the lenses of later uh, Catholic and Christian thinkers, philosophers, and theologians who specifically reference the Stoics. Mm. They, they make a comment about Musonius Rufus or, or or Epictetus 
or that they cite them when they're covering some issue that they pull from them. My, my main area of expertise there is uh, in the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, because I would come to discover that though, though this brilliant philosopher and theologian of the 13th century, it's not believed that he uh, read Greek, you know, he was mm -hmm. proficient in, in Latin. So I don't recall that he cites Epictetus uh, or Masonius Rufus or Aurelius, but he was mm. very conversant with uh, Seneca. Mm. He also cites Cicero a lot, who told us a lot about the Stoics. But, but yeah, for example, so Thomas uses Seneca talking about a variety of topics, including when he addresses anger, the nature of anger, uh, virtues like uh, gratitude and clemency. Mm. So I just found, you know, in my readings over the years, there are many times that prominent Christian thinkers pull approvingly, you know, from the works of the Stoics. I mean, so my kind of theme for mm. for writing that book for my typically uh, Christian audience is to say, hey, you know, there's a plenty of value that comes from human reason, that comes from the Stoic mm. philosophy. It's, it's valuable to anybody today, whether you're a Christian or believe some other religious faith or don't even have a faith. There's some really valuable lessons there in the Stoics, a lot of them. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a really kind of healthy approach, really. And and uh, I started becoming very interested in this, not only because I, you know, I grew up in faith and, and I grew up, uh, you know, as, as a Mormon, um, but, but also, you know, I, I even one of my first clients who I coached uh, through my kind of Stoic mindset coaching was... Um, mm -hmm. a, it was a, a minister over in Canada, uh, shout out to Laura there. Um, and you know, she was, she was using, uh, stoicism to, to essentially enhance, uh, her, her Christianity and to enhance the way that she, she viewed her relationship with God. And, um, and, and so what do you think that stoicism has to offer, people of faith, people, uh, you know, in, in the Christian faith, because I, I, I do have a lot of uh, Christian listeners. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it's something that can cross over very easily. But what do you think Stoicism has to offer? Sure, you know, just I'll get started with a very, very basic mm. general sense here. You know, in the Gospels tell us Christ was asked, you know, what are the most important of all the commandments? And he says, it's the greatest commandment is to love God basically with all that we are, mm. and then our neighbor as, as ourself. So I say, okay, and that's not really necessarily easy to do, right? To put mm. our entire focus upon God, to love our neighbors with the same kind of intensity that we care for ourselves. But I'm saying the Stoics, one thing they do, they can kind of provide us the, the mechanisms, tools, instruments to do that. Because it's hard to have mm. that kind of focus, that kind of love, if, if you're worried about things, if you're fearful, or if you're anxious, or if you're angry at other people, or if you're mm. envious, you know, if you wish you had what they had. So on one very basic level, the Stoics can help us, you know, tame in our emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian virtue is often seen in terms of, uh, or for the natural virtues anyway, bringing our emotions, our passions in line with right reason. That's the way mm -hmm. Thomas Aquinas writes about it. And the way I see it, the, the Stoics, you know, are very much along uh, the lines of that idea. So just in one general way, it's just this idea it can provide us kind of a, a, a technology for, for mm. doing what we're called to do, to be the, have the fullest lives, be the most loving people we can be by not being overrun by all distress and emotions. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and so how do you specifically use stoicism in your life? Like, do, do you have any rituals? Do you have any uh, preferred methods through which you, you incorporate it into your, into your life? Oh, oh, oh yes. The, the the main one, you know, I'm a, a bibliophile. I love to I love to read books. Mm. So part of my daily read, I'm also a very early riser. I may get up at you know three thirty four in the morning. So yeah. I always include some Stoic reading early on. You know, mm. either something from one of the major Stoics, usually Seneca or Epictetus or, or Marcus Aurelius or or Masonius Rufus, or some of the many modern books out there. You know, so mm. I try to read something about the Stoics or by the Stoics. Right now I'm going through Ryan Holiday's and his co-authors, The Daily Stoic, for example, yeah. just reading those little clips already. So I try to do that, you know, th through reading to kind of orient myself to the day. Uh, probably one that I use most often, and I've talked about this in talks before, that I know, for example, Seneca talks about reflections at the end of the day. You're kind of examining mm. what you did during the day. You know, did you live up, uh, live up to your principles? Where did you fail? But uh, being such an early riser, I fall asleep as soon as my head hits the pillow usually, so I don't mm. do that. But I do typically try to start with morning reflections. And one of my favorites 
is the one from the second chapter of Aurelius's Meditations, hmm. where he says, you know, say to yourself every morning upon arising, today I will encounter the busybody, the thankless, the overbearing, the envious, the unneighborly, you know, and so on, kind of preparing yourself for, for the what you're going to encounter during the day, you know, and even though we're a couple thousand years almost after Marcus Aurelius, we're still going to encounter those people, you know. Mm. But part of his exercise is to prepare in advance for, for negative things you're going to encounter from other people. But also tell yourself, remind yourself, as Epictetus says, that whatever it is they're doing, you know, it may not be the best behavior, but in some way they think it's right. So mm. we shouldn't hate them for that. But we also need to remember, too, that their inappropriate actions cannot truly disturb what's highest in us. They can't make mm. us you know, unvirtuous or disturb our souls in the most profound way. So that's probably the, one of the, the basic exercises I, I, I use probably most often is just kind of preparing in advance uh, to, to, you know, bear the kind of insults or injustices mm. you might face during a day. And so instead of flying off the handle, you're, you're, you're ready in advance. Yeah. No, I love that. And that's definitely a popular kind of method for a lot of people is that waking up and kind of reciting Marcus Aurelius as you might call it one of his, yeah, one of his meditations. He, he was meditating on that idea that you will be facing so many, uh, you know, treacherous people, you might say, you know, throughout your day. And that's just, that's just how life is. And that's how people are. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, you have a doctorate in psychology. Is that right? Uh, yes, in clinical psychology. Mm -hmm. mm, that's right. So, so I'd, li I'd like to also know from you, uh, uh, in terms of modern psychology and our understanding of, of, uh, of I guess, psychological method and, and, and um, how to improve the way that you view the world, uh, how does this stack up against our modern understanding of psychology, these sort of practices of, of, of meditating on, on the day? Well, I think they're they're very very uh, uh, well documented for their efficacy by modern uh, psychological methods. Just to give you an example, I I was asked to write a book on loneliness a couple of years ago, mm. the distress that that comes from that, and even in my just you know research reviews, just evidence that's come out within the last decade or so, different psychological studies, they're saying that the most effective treatment for people who are lonely is not just like social skill training, like teaching a person how to make eye contact and say mm. hello. And, in this kind of thing, because most people are actually already know that. Mm. Uh, they're saying the most effective thing was was treating what they call their maladaptive social cognitions, treating the way that they they perceive people in the world. Because when people are lonely for a long time, they tend to become very negative. They tend to expect mm. rejection from others, to 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 fear reaching out. Well, the main kind of methods that are used to counter that kind of thinking are the methods of cognitive psychotherapy. You know, mm. reframing, changing the way you interpret the world. And this, going back to my early training in psychology, I actually came to the Stoics, first to Epictetus, through the writings of the psychologist Albert Ellis, the mm. founder of Rationally Motive Behavior Therapy in the 1950s, mm. and the writings of Aaron Beck, the, the psychiatrist, the founder of uh, Cognitive Therapy. And both mm. of them, you know, come out and boldly, they tell it like it is, that probably their most profound influence was Epictetus, mm. and, and the line that both of them kind of that drew my attention most anyway was from the fifth chapter of Epictetus' handbook, where he says that people are disturbed not by things, but by the views they take of things. Mm. So that fundamental power of, of not letting external events you know, devastate us, we can change the way we interpret them. We can make sure that they're realistic, that they're an accurate representation of what's going on. And we can train ourselves to not be devastated, even if what's actually going on was actually something meant to harm us or mm. insult us. So, so in terms, so just, sorry, it's a long answer, but the most effective methods in psychotherapy today tend to be methods based on cognitive therapy, and those methods owe their origins most explicitly to mm. the stones. Yeah, uh, it's so interesting, and, and, and I'm interested to know as well, like, so let's say you have somebody who comes into you, and you might say that they are very, very attached to those things that are outside of their control. Right. And, and they've fallen into that kind of kind of trap in life. Um, and so they're constantly worrying. They're constantly fearing the future, you know, worried about the past as well, like constantly, you know, bringing up bad memories. Um, how, obviously, it's not an overnight process. And I try to encourage people as much right. as I can to to look at stoicism and their their exploration of it as a very much a long term approach um, to to getting well, you might say. 
but where would you start people on a process like that of, of, of I guess, retraining them to, um, to come back to what they can control and to, to focus on those, th- those, yeah, to focus on changing their mind like that? Yeah, and that's a great question. And I could should clarify that, you know, I got a doctorate in clinical psychology, mm. but my specialty area was neuropsychology, mm, okay. uh, working with Alzheimer's and brain injury patients and so forth. Yeah. So I was mainly involved in assessing m- cognitive abilities, mm, language okay. functioning, memory, reasoning, and so on, and, and rehabilitation of those to some extent. So mm. I had some regular clinical practice with patients during my training, but it wasn't wasn't that extensive. Uh, mm-hmm. But when I did, I, I can answer the question of how I usually tried to start. Because uh, what I found a, a very effective doorway in uh, to the Stoic methods, which just as you say, it doesn't happen overnight. It has to be mm-hmm. built up through, through training. But but I found uh, Ellis's ABC model uh, of emotions very, very helpful in that regard. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure if your listeners would have come across that or not. Actually, or... I wrote this down because I wanted to ask you about this because I know that you've you've talked about it before. So I'm going to let you explain that okay. definitely. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Well, sure. Okay. So I'm going to go back to this Albert Ellis again because he's the hmm. person who influenced me to to read the Stoics uh, themselves when I was a late teen in my early hmm. 20s. But you know, Ellis was a psychotherapist who was trained in psychoanalysis. You know, based hmm. on the theories of Freud. Uh, and for the maybe the first half of the 20th century, those ideas really kind of ruled in the field of psychiatry and clinical psychology. And kind of the key idea was, if you're messed up as an adult, it's because something traumatic happened when you were a child, right? Mm. And they're going to use these methods where you're going to try to tap into your unconscious and tell us about your dreams, your childhood memories, and so forth uh, uh, to get the root of the problem. So it's kind of like the focus was on externals, what mm. happened to you in the outside. Now, in the field of psychology itself, the behaviorists held the sway at the time. People probably heard of people like uh, Pavlov and his dogs, you know, yeah. maybe John Watson, another American behavioral psychologist, or B.F. Skinner, and all of his theories of re- positive reinforcement or reward mm. and punishment and all that. But but those models were, were based on a stimulus response model. Again, something external happens in the outside world, and that produces a, an emotional response within us. And we typically tend to to think this way. Somebody does something to us we don't like, and we might say, you made me angry. You know, it's stimulus and response. Your act produced my anger. Mm. Well, here's where Ellis kind of builds on Epictetus' idea that people are disturbed not by things, but by the views or the beliefs or the judgment about those things. Mm. He takes that stimulus response pattern of the the behaviors. Oh, I, I should backtrack just a little bit, too. It occurred to Ellis himself that... According to the, the, the psychoanalysts, it, it can be true that childhood traumas set you up for disturbance later in life. There's no doubt about that. He said, but if you are disturbed because of some trauma that happened as a child, it's mainly because what you keep telling yourself today about that trauma. And if mm. you can train yourself to interpret it differently, to judge it differently, then you can remove some of the emotional effects of that trauma uh, and move on in life. Mm. And in terms of the stimulus response model, Ellis just recast this a little bit into this ABC model, which I find is very effective once a person kind of gets the, the gist of it and starts to practice it. So let me give an example. One that he himself gives, I find one of the most graphic examples. He says, well, imagine you're in a crowded bus. A humongous man walks right past you, stands squarely on your big toe and smashes it. Walks right on by without saying a word, right? Mm. So in the old stimulus response model, the stimulus, huge guy squashes your toe, response, your toe hurts, and you're, you know, maybe as mad as hell, right? You're angry. Mm. So in Ellis's terminology, he just transforms that a little bit. The stimulus becomes an A, an activating event. Mm -hmm. Okay, the response, the pain, the emotional response, the anger becomes the C, the consequence, the consequence Mm. of that activating event. And normally we think if you thought only in stimulus response term, we'd say, well, yeah, that activating event caused that consequence. The big guy stands on my foot, I'm angry. Well, Ellis says, now imagine this, though. Imagine that guy walks on by. You notice he's wearing very thick, dark glasses and has a white cane. Mm. In other words, okay, that guy's blind. So, you know, now you realize, well, he didn't mean to do that. So your toe is still going to hurt, but hopefully you're not going to be angry at him. Mm. You know, hopefully if you're a person uh, who's trying to live the life of virtue, you might even admire him, that he's able to get out there and do Mm. what he has to, you know, being blind. Okay, so 
one of the elements of cognitive rational therapies and also stoicism is to make sure that your interpretations of events are accurate, that they line up with reality, that they're true. So in that case, if we saw his king, we'd say, well, no, it wasn't true. He didn't mean to do that. So I'm not going to be angry at him. But of course, it goes farther than that, both mm. in cognitive therapy and in the Stoics, because it's possible that this big guy did it on purpose. Maybe he likes to crunch people's toes. Some <laughs> people actually like to cause other people pain. And mm. if they're big and powerful, they might think it's funny to do it to a person who can't, <laughs> probably not going to try to do anything back to them, right? Mm. But, but here, Ellis drawing from the Stoics was like, even there, your toe's still going to hurt, but you don't have to be incapacitated by anger. You don't have to let this ruin your day or disturb you. He says, you know, you might, you'll be reasonably annoyed. You're not going to like that, mm. but you don't have to let it devastate you. You can change your belief. You can say, you know, I, I kind of pity that man that he thinks that's an appropriate way to live in the world. But mm. I know that it's not. And I know I can bear some degree of pain. So I'm going to go on, you know, uh, despite it, I'm not going to let it devastate me. So, so in general, again, Activating event is like a stimulus. The mm. C is the consequence, like the response. What we're focusing on is that belief in the middle, mm. okay, that, that judgment about what happened. And then Ellis adds two other letters, a D and an E. For the D, he says, dispute that your initial belief, you know, oh, this guy's a jerk. Oh, I need to do something about it. Dispute that. Did he really mm. mean it? Or do I really need to get angry over it, even if he did it, right? You dispute that. He said, and if you can reframe that, if you can change that view, then it can lead you to E, which is a new emotional response, mm. you know, where, where you're, now you're not devastated anymore. And, you know, Epictetus himself talks about test your impressions, the same concept there. So, so for me, I remember early on, one of the most powerful tools was this ABC theory. So yeah. when I encountered anything that was upsetting me, I'd start to look at the whole situation and say, can I interpret that more realistically or, or more, uh, you know, uh, efficiently in a way that's going to lead, you know, not to my happiness, not to distress. Mm. Yeah, I love that because it, it essentially gives you a method through which you can actually, you know, start to use this in your life and, and start to do what Epictetus said and, and, and question the, the, you know, the situations in your life and how you, what you believe about them. And that's a that's a tough one as well because we hold our beliefs so strongly. It's like something happens to us and then we immediately make up, up our minds about what what that yes. means to us, right? And yes. so what would you suggest to people who okay, so something happens to you in that moment when you make up your judgment, sometimes it's really hard, especially if it's a really big event, you know, something like yeah, somebody crushes your toe it's really hard to pause in that moment, right? And actually think about, about mm -hmm. uh, you know, what is the right response to this situation? How would you encourage people or what would you uh, tell people to do in order to, I guess, open up that box to rationality a little bit, a bit, bit better in that moment? Yeah, that's a good question. And here, you know, because it's almost instantaneous and there, you know, there's certain element of emotions that, that just come across us almost mm. instantly. We can't, you know, if you find yourself at the edge of a cliff, even if you're a great stoic, you're probably going to have that sense of fear and you're going to feel that, yeah. that rush yeah. when you realize that danger. So some of the, you know, physiological reactions kind of come from lower brain centers are virtually instantaneous. Mm. But we can train ourselves in a situation like that. It might be just a simple word like, you know, to yourself, just stop, you know, mm -hmm. or just hold on. The idea that you're going to try to pause for a minute and reflect. And some of the old common sense wisdom is if you're angry, you know, count to 10. Mm. Well, there is some sense there. But but if you're counting to 10, you're not just you know, holding off to be more angry when your count's over. you got to do something during that count. Mm. And I believe that, I think it's Seneca, even told a story along these lines. I believe it involved the philosopher Plato. And mm. one of his servants, you know, did, did something that really distressed him and upset him. And he was going to, to physically punish him. He said then it. Then Plato realized when his hand was up in the air, he just froze and, and held it there. And he realized, you know, my behavior, here I am, you know, this is a philosopher who cares for truth and beauty and goodness. My behavior would be worse than that uneducated servant's for, for what he did if mm. I punished him unjustly. So he said, I'm going to stop and I'm going to wait and determine the punishment once I'm no longer angry, you know. Mm. So for ourselves, I think it can try to, try to do that, try to slow down. Now, often it's not going to happen. We're still going to act inappropriately. I do it myself, of course, sometimes. Mm -hmm. But then we want to develop that habit, maybe through a morning or a nighttime reflection to look back and say, hey, you know, 
Did I let the did I did I act as if the A caused the C? Did I not take responsibility for that uh, belief in between? So so it really is a matter of you know first an awareness that you really can control some of this to some extent, and then like any virtue, building it through practice, trying to find situations mm -hmm. you know where it impl applies in one way or another. And I like the way, you know, when, when you use Ellis's formula, A, B, C, D, it's almost like an algebra because you can substitute any event, you know, or any emotion uh, for those factors there. But yeah, mm. it's a great question. To, to, you can just know this stuff abstractly, but it's not going to do you a bit of good unless you do try to apply it in the, the everyday situations in your own life. Yeah. Yeah. No, and, and, and what I'm getting here as well is I'm, I'm seeing a uh, like a similar link between what we're talking about now and and what uh, Christianity would talk about in terms of uh, that moment before you do something that you know is wrong. It's like uh, that that temptation they would call it, you know, to do yes. sin or evil or something that you know you shouldn't be doing. Um, and and I know that a lot of people struggle to to I, I guess. Uh, think about how they should approach those moments when they 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 feel weak, right? And, and you might call it uh, discipline versus weakness. You know, like in that moment when you know that there's one thing that you should do, mm -hmm. but you still choose to do the thing that is wrong. Uh, in in terms of a a, a Christian, do you think that the, 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 the Stoicism can offer people in Christianity a framework through which they can work through those? You know, that avoidance of temptation, you might call it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I did, I did a book a few years back on uh, the seven deadly sins, kind of giving mm. their, their history and scripture and different thinkers. Oh, by uh, the way, I would so love to have a uh, another discussion down the line just about that book because that sounds yeah incredibly interesting. But yeah, well, let's do it. Yeah, because yeah. the, the first half is historical. I look at key figures and what they had to say about them. Then the last half, you know, addresses them. Uh, one by one, and, mm -hmm. and I found that there's a lot, you know, in the writing of the Stoics, of course, that would apply to this. But, but one of the people, one of the Eastern Church Fathers, a Greek, or Saint John Climacus, um, really kind of laid out like kind of a step-by-step -step process uh, how you move from like tempting thoughts, whether or not it results in actual sinful behavior, or not looking at kind of as a cognitive process as we go down the line. Mm -hmm. And there's some some Stoics that talk about this kind of thing, like Seneca, when he talks about like a what was going on, like proto emotions, the beginnings of emotions, these natural physiological reactions that we might have that make us angry or full of lust, you know, mm. or, or envious or whatever. So yeah, it is a matter of training ourselves again to, to slow down, kind of go step by step through this process, to so we can we can conflict it. Like someone talk about, you know, well first we need to be aware when we're feeling these emotions. Okay, now my blood's starting to boil, boil, you know, I, I'm mad, and then try to catch that as early as possible in the process, just kind of start arguing with ourselves through our internal talk to try to tone that down and keep it from happening. Mm. Um, like Epitinus talks about this. I just was reviewing the handbook again today. And, and he says, you know, if you're tempted to saw some behavior that, you know, as Christians we would call uh, sinful, he says, you know, he says also think about two times. He says, just don't think about the time you're performing the sinful behavior. He says, think about the time afterwards. How are you mm. going to feel? You know, are you going to be proud of yourself? Are you going to be ashamed? Is this going to have harmed someone? So there's, yeah, the stoic ideas can be extremely helpful in helping us conquer sin mm. because, uh, you know, and one of the main, main ways in Christian teaching that we conquer sin is by building virtue. And mm. boy, you know, the stoics know something about, about cultivating virtue, you know, because when you become you know, truly virtuous, the the temptation and many sins are going to fall off because you're mm -hmm. going to realize these are for things that aren't important. These are for things that are either outside of my control or, or won't lead me to be a good person or won't make me useful to others. So I'd say, yeah, in a, for a lot of ways, stoic ideas can be very helpful to helping us lead a Christian life if that if that's our goal. Mm, yeah, yeah, and I think I think uh, what what I find so helpful about the stoic view of virtue is. It is very much based in in action and doing good things yes. in your life, trying to you know develop your skills, develop your talents, and uh, you know I find in life when you're not focused on developing your skills, when you're not focused on moving forward and and you know improving your career, improving your relationships, if if you're not busy in those really good tasks that make you 
essentially a human being, you can fall into the trap of actually living your life in a constant battle between, uh, you know, well, you know, I know I should be doing this, but, you know, I want to do that. And then, you know, you get lazy and then laziness and it leads to forming other bad habits. And then it, it, you can kind of get down to a level where your life is full of you just making these decisions of should I do this or not? Whereas if you just get busy doing good things like working on your career, working on your relationships, you know, working on your fitness, which we can get to soon, um, mm-hmm. you know, you don't have time to even think about those other bad habits, right? It's like, because you're so That's focused right. on, on being busy doing what's good. Um, well, absolutely. Like uh, Epictetus Corp makes a lot of deal of the prohairesis or moral mm-hmm. purpose as different translations. But yeah. If that's your main goal, becoming a fulfilled person, having that good flow of life, developing your capacities, you know, for your own enjoyment and for others' betterments, then yeah, then you're not going to be focused on on these these distractions nearly so much. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's right. So I think I think it's probably good to encourage people to, you know, when when you're busy, focused on something that you know is meaningful, that you know is is going to bring you a lot of purpose. You just don't have time to think about, you know, whether you're going to waste six hours on the Xbox or, you know, whether you're going to, you know, do those things that, you know, are just going to lead you backwards. Um, but but I wanted to jump into a couple other areas here because you're, you're a multifaceted man. I'm very interested in, in all the different areas that you're that you've kind of like uh, excelled in. Um, but fitness. Tell me about your, uh, your, your kind of journey with fitness and, and how you have, have essentially, you've talked about the stoic workout before. I'm very mm-hmm. interested in, in your perspective here, but um, yeah, tell us about your, your experience with fitness. Sure. You know, and I, I, I dabble in different fitness things, running, and I've done the Highland Games, you know, the Scottish heavy events, tossing no of the cable. No way. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, I've done 10-man tug-of-war teams, <laughs> a little bit of bodybuilding, <laughs> Olympic-style weightlifting, powerlifting. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but my main interest was always in the strength sports. And I, I, mm. I work out right now, actually, I must admit, I'm retired. I work out six days a week now in these mm-hmm. brief, you know, focused workouts. Mm. But when I was, well, how old was I? I mean, I was a, in kindergarten. I was mesmerized by Superman, the old black and white TV show. I mm. thought, wow, I just love that physical prowess. This idea of this guy, you know, who's built up his body. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm here in the United States of America. His motto was, it's all for truth, justice, and the American way, right? Mm. So he has all this power, but he's not using it to dominate people, right? He's using it to do good things. Well, so as a little kid, I actually wanted to be Superman. But, but as I got a little bit older, I realized that wasn't going to work. But at about second grade, I saw an Olympic weightlifter on television. I thought, okay, now that is a real human being. That's what I want to do. Mm. So I demanded that my dad get me my first weight set from, I think I was just in second grade still. And by the time I was in about seventh grade, 12 years old or so, I started working out regularly. And I have now for 45 years or, mm. or, or, or something now for, over, over that, I guess. That's awesome. But, you know, but I've always been a fan of fitness. So... You know, in my late teens, I discovered the Stoics and started, you know, reading them off and on, Seneca, Epictetus, uh, Marcus Aurelius. So whenever they talked about something related to fitness, I kind of, you know, perked, you know, okay, I'm going to underline that. I'm going to make a mental note of that. Hmm. So it occurred to me later on, after I'd written one of my first, uh, I think it was after my second book, I wanted to write a book about kind of the old Greco-Roman idea of a healthy mind and a healthy body. Hmm. Uh, then I was actually asked by a Catholic publisher to do a book on on that topic, but showing like the Catholic approach to to the body and physical fitness. So I said, sure, I'll do that. Mm. Uh, but in doing that, I still incorporated a lot of those Stoic insights I came across. Mm. And let me just give you just real briefly a few examples, and you can decide if you want to dig deeper in, in any yeah. of these. Well, a Stoic I discovered years later was Musonius Rufus. His writings aren't as extensive and the, the translations weren't as common. Hmm. But but he talks about, compares uh, virtues to proper training of the body, uh, disciplining your body so you have control over it. There's also a sense where, you know, even though the Stoics want to pursue virtue as the highest good, we also have roles and duties. It's hmm. going to be harder to fulfill those if we're sickly, you know, or, or laid up in bed, though we, we can handle it if that happens to us, but it's not hmm. going to be our our desire. So, so even as living the philosophical life, there's something to be said about taking care of your body. Hmm. So, but I found the most explicit references to this kind of thing in, in Seneca 
in an Epictetus. I'll start with one from Seneca, because the system of training I've done the most over the years is something they call HIT or high intensity training. Mm. It's basically where you do some very intense, heavy exercises, but pretty briefly, limited amount of time. You ne don't necessarily repeat it very often. So it's kind of like you're trying to get the biggest bang from your buck, investing yeah. a little bit of time and getting maximum results. Well, Seneca even has a line where he talks about taking care of the body. He says, hey, you know, it's good. We should take care of our bodies. And he said exercise every day. He he walked and, and did other things, but he said also there are certain specific exercises that are brief and efficient that you can wear yourself out in a short period of time mm. and then go on back to the more important things of your, of, uh, you know, of virtue and your soul. Mm. So I thought, man, that kind of has some parallels with the idea behind the high intensity training. You know, you're going to, you're not going to spend all day on it. You're going to try to make, do something that's efficient. You can spend a little bit of focus time and get a result there. So. Hmm. So I see his commonalities in, in that concept with the high intensity training. But Epictetus, he talks about fitness in several different places. And one of my favorites, you know, being a weightlifter, hmm. he references Milo, Milo of Crotona, the, this ancient Greek, and he's considered the father of weightlifting. Mm -hmm. He's this guy that the fable says he lifted a calf every day when he was young. You know, as the calf got yeah. bigger, yeah. Milo kept yeah. lifting, so he gets bigger and bigger, you know. Until he eventually becomes the greatest Olympic wrestling champion ever for like two decades or something. Mm. He was he was uh, undefeated. And um, he's such an interesting guy. Aristotle references him. Thomas Aquinas does years later. But Epictetus does too. And Epictetus says uh, this. He says, just because I can't be a Milo, you know, the very top, most strongest man in the world, he goes, it doesn't mean I won't take care of my body. He says, just because I can't be the best in any field doesn't mean I won't be the best uh, that I can be. So yeah. here Epictetus has this idea that we shouldn't become absorbed in our bodies, and, and most of us are never going to be the best in any particular physical activity or sport, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't take care of ourselves. <laughs> and then in one other section there, and he talks about it in multiple sections, but one other of my favorites, he says, you know, if you're training basically for a marathon, there's a certain way you're going to train. If you're training for the pentathlon, these five events that involve more strength, mm. you know, you're going to have a different way of training. So, so basically, your training in life needs to match what your activity is going to be. Mm. Oh, yeah. And in one example, he even talks about contrasts a long distance runner to a sprinter. And later, the people that talked about HIT training, the high intensity strength training, used that very same distinction. They said, if you look at the body of a marathon runner whose goal is endurance, mm. it's going to look very different from the body of a sprinter whose goal is brief, intense spurts of activity. The, yeah. so the sprinter yeah. typically has, is more heavily muscle because that's that's what he needs, that explosive power. So so the modern hit people say, well, your strength training, if your goal is to develop stronger, bigger muscle, should be more like the training of a sprinter than that of a long distance runner, you know? Mm. So there's all kinds of these little gems there in the Stokes where you're thinking, wow, I mean, they understood a lot even back then. And I'm sorry, Simon, I gotta go on one other thing. No, I, did that do, yeah. work, I, I titled it, Show Me Your Shoulders. And that yeah, was a direct quote from mm. Epictetus. And here's what he meant by that. He said, if I go up to an athlete, you know, and said, show me, you know, show me, show me what you can do. Show me that you're an athlete. And they show me their equipment, their throwing weights or something. Hmm. Epictetus says, you know, go to, go hang. I don't want to see your equipment. He says, show me your shoulders. In other words, he's saying, show me the results of your activity. Have they built yeah. you up? Have they made you stronger, faster, more enduring? So again, I love that that stoical common sense view that if you're going to devote time to training in any field, you should really, you know, monitor yourself and see is it really achieving uh, the the goal that I'm after. Hmm. Yeah. No, I love that. Yeah, it's got to be measurable, obviously. Uh, so that you're not just going there and you know doing just any workout and then it's just you know, like you've got to have a goal and you've got to have that ability to to measure what you're achieving but i love i love that we're talking about fitness and stoicism because i think i'm biased because i'm in the fitness industry right and so you know, i'm very interested in keeping my body healthy and keeping it strong and um it's not as strong as it could be it's not as enduring as it could be but i'm working on it but oh, sure. um it, it, it always tends to, uh, uh, I guess, bug me a little bit when I hear people interpreting the Stoics uh, and, and the way that they talk about the body as the body is outside of our control. So don't place too much importance on it. And I think that they're essentially taking, um, taking that idea of what's in our control and what's outside of our control a little bit too far. 
because now that we are in modern times, we really understand more about our bodies than ever. And I think that one thing is very clear. We do have a lot more control over our body than, than we previously thought. Right. And people tend to just place too much of a, or, or too little of an importance on taking care of the body. And on top of that, I don't think people see fully how interconnected the mind is with the body oh, and yes. the, the way that you can think so much clearer when you are taking care of your body and you're eating the right foods, drinking enough water, training right. Uh, like, and you probably feel this as well. Straight after a workout, it's the best feeling ever. It's, it's like, damn, the mind is clear. I've done something disciplined. So I, I really want to encourage people to, and you might have something to say about this as well, but I want to encourage people to really take it seriously, the fact that you can think better when your body is better because it's interconnected. How do you find that in terms of the connectedness between your mind and your body? Oh, yeah, a absolutely. You know, people have kind of known that intuitively for a long time. Yeah, you feel better, you know. Mm -hmm. In recent decades, we... We get the research even showing a chemical basis on the things like the endorphins, you know, from, mm -hmm. from physical activity. Excuse me. There's a book I read a few years ago called Spark by an American psychiatrist. His last name is Ratey, R-A-T-E-Y, but I'm, I'm blocking on his first name. But, mm -hmm. but he's a psychiatrist, but he's quoting study after study after study showing that the brain itself is far more plastic, changeable than we realized mm -hmm. in exercise both, you know, endurance, cardiovascular type exercise and the strength training exercise have remarkable impact on the body in terms of, you know, things like the endorphins, different hormones, testosterone, growth hormone, different even growth factors within nerve cells in the brain. Mm. So we are really finding now that, 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 yes, exercise definitely can enhance your ability to think clearly and your ability to retain your cognitive abilities as you get older, you know. Mm. And this has been something of interest to me because I used to work at an Alzheimer's center, you know, I have this special interest in, in aging. I'm getting there myself. I'll turn 59 tomorrow as we speak. Mm. <laughs> and the fact that you're still training six days a week, that that's so inspiring to me. And I want to encourage people as well. Like every time somebody walks into my gym and they're you know over 50 and they're they're in the gym ready to get started i i congratulate them because i say listen you're at the point in your life right now where you need to make a decision are you going to start working out and taking care of your body or are you going to descend into just you know immobility and you know like weakness and uh, like it's can you just talk okay i'm going to let you finish your thought because that was really important what you're talking about but also if you could touch on the importance for people who are over 50 uh, or getting older in their life of, of really starting those positive, healthy habits as well. Oh, yeah, that that's a great question. Just to finish up a little bit where I was mm. going, just as you get yeah, older. Please do. And, and even in the 90s when I was enmeshed in, in my the Alzheimer's research, that, you know, there was no known way then, I don't believe there is now, to reverse Alzheimer's once the brain tissue damage is done. Mm. And there was no guarantee to, to keep you from getting it but the general rule of thumb was and is that catchphrase, use it or lose it. Mm. And it applied both to mental activity and to physical activity. Mm. To use your brain, to be re read about new things, learn new things, you know, be open to experience mentally, but also physical, physical exercise to keep you mentally uh, acute as you go through the years. But like if you're doing with, with training people, I'm not exactly sure what kind of you know, regimen you use, because not everyone you know, has to work out mm. six days a week. There's just different methods for, yeah. the main reason I do that now is that I'm retired from full-time work. I just write mm. and speak. So I, I'm easily able to go to the gym and I just actually enjoy, I enjoy it. So I'm yeah. happy to six days a week. But, but yes, as you get older, you know, hit 40, 50 and beyond. Yeah. I mean, the body's natural tendency uh, is to develop what some people have called like a, a sick uh, aging syndrome where you, your muscle mass decreases, your, your bones start to, you know, uh, get osteopenia, mm. losing bone mass, kind of a downhill slide in multiple body organs. And not, and it's a great deal of that is reversible. A lot of that, you know, there's some genetic programming that'll kick in over time, but mm. a lot of that is disuse. It's from not training our bodies, from not uh, uh, eating properly. 
for myself, you know, like right now, my main interest, my main focus is strength. I just love heavy, mm. uh, heavy weightlifting and, and of different kinds. And now, like I said, I'll turn 59 tomorrow. And I'm honestly, I was thinking back on this, I'm stronger than, than I was at any time since my late 30s. Wow. I'm stronger than any point that I was in my 40s or early 50s. You know, now that I have more leisure and more focus to really train myself. So, so a person can make tremendous changes in the way they feel, in the way they look. And yeah, if you're over 50 or 60 or even 70, you know, it's not about developing a beach body. It's not about having yeah. necessarily, you, you might still want that. And maybe you can, and some actually still do achieve that. Mm. But it's more likely what you said about keeping your functionality, you know, yeah. still being able to do the things that you enjoy doing. Like one thing my wife and I'd like to do now is do, uh, international travel and i'll tell you i'd love to get to australia someday yeah definitely. But, but now usually you know we're in the united states usually we'll get over to to different european countries right now but but even the people who travel a lot say hey you know do this while you're physically able because later mm. in life you know you may not be able to you may not be able to do demanding trips but but the more you train throughout your life the more likely you're going to be able to extend the period of years where you can get out there and do mm. things and kind of compress that end of life to where if you do become frail and all, it's going to be a much briefer, more condensed period of time. So it's so like people like you, if you're, you know, you're physically training people, I mean, you are doing those people, of course, as you know, a world of good. Mm. When I was younger, I did work as a, as a fitness instructor myself. And I must say, that was one of the most gratifying jobs I've, I've ever done in my life for yeah, people we, of, all, of all ages. Definitely. And, and I think one of the great things is about it is, is because you, you literally see the changes that people are making, right? So if you mm -hmm. tell somebody to read a book, unless you were to have a conversation with them and see that they've changed their mind about a few, a few things, you know, it's, it's hard to actually, you know, see those changes. But when you see somebody training, um, you know, not only do you see changes in their body, but you see changes in the way that they feel, the way that they talk, the way that they interact with people. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's fine. It's like they find, um, a new way of being right. And, and I want to encourage people as well, because training can be one of the best ways to practice philosophy, right. To, to use it in almost in, in a completely unified state. It's like when you're training, it's not just about your body, right? It's about your mental stability. It's about your, your discipline and training that part of your mind that is willing to push yourself a little bit further than what you probably think you can go. But, but in the end, uh, it's not just about the body. It's about everything using your body and your mind. And in the end you, you, you get stronger in both of those areas. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I just want to encourage people just to really think about that and to, uh, yeah, use use training as a method of practicing philosophy, right? Oh, absolutely. I think of a couple of things that, that drew to mind. One thing, I know when, when my, I have two sons that are adults now, but when they were little, you know, sometimes they would say about something, oh, uh, oh, I, I can't do that. That's hard. Mm. And I wouldn't say, no, that's easy. I'd say, well, yeah, that's hard, but you can do hard things. You yeah, know? yeah, that's it. Train yourself to do hard things. So sometimes, like when I've written about the, the virtues in fitness, sometimes I highlight the virtue of a fortitude or, or sometimes it's called courage, but mm. the ability to overcome difficult objects, to, uh, obstacles to do worthwhile things, even if they're hard. So, mm. you know, strength training definitely involves doing things that are physically hard, that are taxing. And then endurance training, there's an endurance component to, to courage and fortitude, staying the course when it gets tough. Mm. So, you know, strength training, endurance training, virtually any kind of Physical training is also a training ground for that kind of mental fortitude. And maybe when you're in the gym or out running or in the pool swimming or whatever, and you realize, wow, I can do things now that I didn't think I could do, you know, mm -hmm. that may carry over, should carry over to other aspects of the person's life. Mm. Now, that's a really good point. It's not that things are easy. It's that things are very difficult, but you have the ability to overcome them. Because, you know, you're a human being, you're smart, you can, you can, you can change your mind, you can change your actions. Uh, and that's another great thing about watching people go through transformations with, with their health and fitness. It's like you watch, you watch them literally increase their span of, of abilities, right? And so whether yes. it's increasing your mobility, increasing your strength, it's very measurable and you can see that 
yeah, like yesterday, like I think of last week, um, I, I was actually doing a session with one of my personal trainers and um, I finally hit the goal of doing a 200% body weight deadlift. And for me, that was, that you know, I said to myself, you know, nine weeks ago to the PT, I said, listen, if, if I can do 200% body weight, that to me is my ideal spot. I don't feel like I need to continue as in getting even stronger. I feel like that's a good test of health uh, in terms mm -hmm. of my, my back mm -hmm. strength. Um, and, you know, when you hit that goal, it's it's extremely motivating. And, and, and you kind of say to yourself, okay, cool. Well, if I can train over nine weeks and kick this goal, what else can I do over a year, over 10 years, over, you know, you, you think to yourself that a whole new world of possibilities opens when you realize that you can train your body, you can kick goals with your body and, and get to new levels. So, um, oh. now I know that we've gone through a whole lot of stuff here. I'm just trying to make sure that I haven't missed anything. We've talked about fitness. We've talked, talked about, uh, your, your work with, uh, Christianity and, and stoicism. We probably can have many, many, many conversations on, on all of this sort of stuff. But, um, I thought we might finish, uh, going back to the start, to the Christian side of things. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell us about your journey going from atheism to Catholicism, right? Cause you wrote a whole book about this, right? Yes. Yes. And just to put it in brief, I was raised, you know, in a Catholic family, went through Catholic mm -hmm. grade school and, and high school. Uh, though we weren't, you know, particularly religious at home, we didn't really pray together. We didn't read the Bible, things like that. Yeah. But I had the Catholic upbringing. I never questioned it. Uh, in my late teens, I read some, I really got in, into philosophy, mm. partly by reading the articles of a particular Mike Messer, a top bodybuilder in the day, who, who was also interested in philosophy. So I read mm. uh, Friedrich Nietzsche and Ayn Rand and Bertrand Russell and, and atheists, and they, they led me to arguments that, I, but that really kind of took away my faith. I thought, these are good arguments. I didn't think it was reasonable to believe in God. Mm. So I, I spent about 25 years where I considered myself an atheist. I, I didn't have anything against Christians or people who believed other religions. So if that's good, if that mm. helps them, that's great. I just thought I couldn't honestly believe it, you know. Um, during those years, though, I got a lot from some very good philosophy from I read the Stoics. I read Aristotle. Uh, also, in terms of modern thinkers, I read a lot of the philosopher Ayn Rand. She was a Russian. She came to America. She was a novelist, Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, and wrote about the virtue of selfishness and all this. And, and she was an atheist, but she said, she claimed that her philosophy was pretty much an extension of Aristotle's. Mm. Now, I also read a lot of Albert Ellis, the rationally motive founder we talked about earlier. Mm. And, and he was also an atheist, but of course he borrowed a lot from the Stoics. Um, now, so later... 25 years later, there was a series of events that led me to read St. Thomas Aquinas for the first time. And kind of the major aha there was there were a few arguments I read in the atheists that I found that were the most powerful. One was the idea that the idea of God was self-contradictory, like God couldn't be both all-powerful and all-knowing if he was. How can he do something different from tomorrow that he planned to do today? You know, things mm -hmm. like that. And also the idea that, that God was unnecessary. You don't need the, the universe is a foundation. Open your eyes, and there it is. The Ayn Rand, the objectivist, talked talk that way. Or Bertrand Russell would say, who made God? You know, implying mm -hmm. that, that God himself would need a creator, so it doesn't really explain anything. Well, when I read Thomas for the first time and, and read his proofs about the existence of God, his writings on the attributes of God, I felt that these arguments of the atheists were answered very, very well by Thomas 700 some years ago, borrowing from more ancient uh, thinkers. So anyway, mm. it led me to think that the belief in God really is reasonable when I when I look through these proofs and these descriptions in detail. But then I had another insight. I realized all these years I highly respected the Stoics and, and Aristotle. And while Rand, who claimed she was influenced by Aristotle, was an atheist, and Ellis, who was influenced by the Stoics, was an atheist, Aristotle himself, you know, he wasn't a Christian, of course, he lived 300 years before Christ, and he mm. wasn't a Jew, but he, but his reason led him to a prime mover to some sense of a god of a higher power, and the Stoics themselves, as you're aware, kind of have, you know, different views on, on whether there is a god or what is god, mm. is god nature or fate, is he a part of the universe, did he create the universe, there's different views there, but Stoicism itself certainly did not necessitate uh, atheism, 
Mm. And some of the Stoics, especially Epictetus, do talk about God in a way that sounds very Christian-like, almost that is a, as, as a person there. So anyway, it was my early 40s that I decided that a belief in God was very reasonable, and I, I could embrace that again. And I have, I have since, and then one of the joys to me is since that time, I found some of the most amazing ways in which some Christian thinkers have borrowed from the Stoics. Mm. And do we have a second for me to tell you just one real kind of extreme yeah, example? Yeah, please, please. Take your time. Yeah. All right. Well, I've known for years that, that Thomas borrowed from Seneca like things like analyzing anger. Because Seneca mm. wrote you know, the whole book, De Ira, on, on anger. He borrowed a lot there. Of course, Thomas was heavily influenced by Aristotle. In one section, he even kind of tries to reconcile the position of Aristotle and Seneca, saying how they really weren't that far apart if you look at it from the, the right mm. perspective. He, he borrows all kinds of quotations from Seneca when he looks at the virtue of gratitude, how we should be thankful for what other people do for us. Because, you know, Seneca wrote that book uh, on benefits, mm. you know, essentially about gratitude and ingratitude. So he talked about them there in a few other places. But here's a, a very surprising one I came across just the other day in working in a new book on Thomas Aquinas. And this is not for the, the, the theology itself, because different Christian groups have different views here. But it just surprised me how Thomas used Seneca in this instance. Hmm. He was talking about the Catholic uh, doctrine of something called limbo. And it's actually not in the current catechism. It's not a really well-defined thing. But the idea was that, you know, Christ told people, said that people need to be baptized to be saved. So the old teaching, the doctrine was, what would happen to babies or other people who, who were not baptized? You know, are they going to go to hell? Hmm. Uh, it doesn't seem that they can go to heaven. Where are they going to go? Uh, so some of this teaching was there was a, a, a concept of, of limbo, a place where where these people would go that they wouldn't have the beatific vision of God in heaven, but neither would they be tortured in hell. Hmm. So here's how Thomas brings in Seneca. In one of his questions, he said, some people think that these infants would be tortured in hell because they were just because they were not baptized. And Thomas argued, no, that would not be the case. They would not suffer torment. And here's where he cites Seneca. He said, Seneca said that a, a wise person is not disturbed by things that they cannot control or have no say over. Mm. And Thomas elaborates and says that, um, you know, we're typically not upset that we can't fly like a bird or that we're not kings or emperors, you know, mm. because we know that's beyond our power. So his argument was, well, the same thing will happen to these souls, he thought. Uh, they, they won't see God in heaven, but they will have the heights of what natural virtue and happiness can bring. But mm. I just thought it was so interesting to see the way he explicitly pulled Seneca into his uh, the argument he used on this topic. Mm. Yeah, I'm very yeah. interested. In, and I think that there's definitely more room for, for heaps more of these conversations down the line. But I'm very interested in, in the interconnectedness of, of philosophy and religion and how philosophy enhances religion and how religion can, yeah. can potentially enhance philosophy. You know, it's there's, there's very interesting connections there. Um, but I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And I think what, what really uh, uh, impresses me about who you are is that, like you're, you're, you're very interested, not, not just in the, you know, the belief of a religion or not, uh, as I've said multiple times, you're a multifaceted person. You, you're, you're very well read. You know, you're, you're, you, you've obviously uh, thought a lot about uh, like the interconnectedness of, of the philosophy and everything and, and who is influenced by who. And, um, and yeah, it's exciting to, to hear from you about this sort of stuff and, and, and about your journey kind of going from, yeah, in and out of, of uh, Catholicism. And, um, but yeah, I, Kevin, I really, really appreciate you coming on the show and I really appreciate this conversation. It's been eye opening to say the least, but um, hopefully we'll get to have you, have you back many times. I would love to, Simon, and thank you what you do for transforming people physically and for what you do here by spreading the, uh, these wonderful messages of Stoics and, and good philosophy. Now, well, look, as often as you'll come back, that's as often as I'll have you. I can't wait to have many more conversations. And, um, and yeah, I know that this is going to be super valuable for, for many people who are listening. So thanks again. Well, thank you so much, Simon. Take care. All right, so there you have it, my interview with Dr. Kevin Vost. Uh, such a great guy, such a kind person, and so incredibly knowledgeable. Um, I just 
really grateful that he came on. And guys, make sure you head to the links in the show notes, grab his books, uh, you know, go on there, let him know how much you appreciated him coming on the show because we want to have him back as many times as possible. So, uh, Kevin, thank you so much. And to everybody listening, thank you so much as well. And look forward to many more interviews coming up very soon. So uh, I'll talk to you next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.